Over the years, the flat, featureless roads of northern France, close to the Belgian borders, have provided the canvas on which the sport's images have been painted. The artisans have always been here. We came in 1984, and since then have witnessed every facet of this cruel event. In our first year, Sean Kelly gave Ireland her first victory. It was also the year that the prize list was modernised, from $1,000 to $20,000 for the win. But we wondered, too, if the pain was worth the money. It was also the first year for American Greg LeMond, but he failed to finish. The following year, the riders didn't have to worry too much about the roads. There weren't any. The rain and mud left the course and the riders completely unrecognisable. But even so, a great champion always emerges from the quagmire, and in this case it was Frenchman Marc Madio, only the second home winner in 29 years. And Le Mans finally made it too at the second attempt. At least, we think it was Le Mans. In 1986, we saw the more serious aspect of his charge to Roubaix, the dangers of the pileup and the injuries that followed. It's these riders, unwillingly, who created the image of this amazing race. It was also a first for the All-American 7-Eleven team, but only one made it to the end. Le Mans, with hopes of victory, was left on the roadside, his dreams shattered by a broken bicycle, ever so close to Roubaix, where Sean Kelly gained his second win in three years. Last year, Kelly, still the world's number one, was in front again, but this time chasing a virtual unknown by the name of Patrick Verslice. But it was the Rhodes again who wrote the script. <laughs> Riders falling near the finish, including Kelly, who was pushed back into the fray too late to stop the Belgian superstar, Eric van der Rohden, from catching Verslice and winning the race. Van der Rohden ended the latest chapter in an extraordinary tale that has been updated since 1896. Today, like every second Sunday in April since 1967, Compiègne, 50 miles north of Paris, prepares itself to write the next chapter of this intriguing story. Van der Arden is back to defend his title, and with three major wins already this year, he's again a favourite. The last rider to win twice in succession was the Italian Francesca Moser, eight years ago. Sean Kelly, the Irishman who's been the world's number one since rankings were first given in 1983, is also back. Win number three is on his mind. It's a nice day. No snow. Bob Rowe was the only 7-Eleven team finisher in 86 and the only American to finish last year. He's joined this time by young Roy Nickman, whose bicycle talent is seen as exceptional. Single day races aren't the speciality of American star Andy Hampston, so he doesn't feel the pressure to win. But all of France expects much from this man. First to arrive in the square this morning, Laurent Fignon is expected to be the first to Roubaix as well. The two-time winner of the Tour de France is showing signs of his halcyon days since recovering from injury. He's much on his mind, including his new hairstyle. So, on this fine spring morning, everyone has optimistic hopes, but it's an illusion that cannot disguise the chaos and danger over the next seven hours. With more on that, here's Tim Brandt. When a professional cyclist prepares for Paris-Roubaix, it is with a sense of impending dread and danger, and of course glory. I'm Tim Brandt. It's just a one-day race in a 275-day season, but it's the greatest race of all. All the sports legends have won here, and to be considered among the elite, you must win Paris-Roubaix. To win it all, you take a chance on losing the entire season in a bloody crash. You punish your body like this just one day a year. You fight the elements, the wind, the dust, and the cobblestones for seven hours, 166 miles. To survive the hell of the north requires sacrifice. To win, you must be willing to risk it all.
Moments before the start, 199 cyclists from 19 nations prepare for the beginning of this torturous tour. Missing, however, Greg LeMond and Stephen Roche due to injury. This cloudless, crisp morning is also a surprise. It's been six years since the conditions for this race have been anything but menacing. The calm demeanor of the cyclists belies the intense uneasiness they must feel inside, knowing what's ahead. And the question begs, which cyclist will make headlines and join the elite? For the winner will not carve his niche, but chisel it in the history books of racing. stage of this trek through antiquated villages and desolate farmland is more like a festive parade. Ironically, despite its name, this race is not really Paris to Roubaix. It actually starts some 50 miles from Paris in a city called Compiègne, a town known more as the historical site for both the German armistice in World War I and the French surrender in World War II. Now, it's known for the starting point of this event. So as they roll out of Compiègne, the course winds its way toward the Belgian border over roads which appear flat and seemingly easy to ride. But the size of the pack is already causing collisions. Dangers are hidden in numbers, and it's not as tranquil as it may seem. When you think of recent success in Perry Roubaix, you think of Sean Kelly. The two-time winner always controls the pace and commands respect from everybody with aspirations of winning here. No serious contender is likely to make a move until he does. Defending champion Eric Vander Aert will wait and watch. Curiosity seekers are anxious to find out if Lauren Fignon can do well after his three-year absence. He, too, is sure to seek Kelly's company. While down below, the race is just beginning. Only 26 miles after leaving Compiègne, the attacks begin. Almost by tradition, a group escapes early. It rarely succeeds, but that doesn't stop them trying. And one of those who wants to try is American Roy Nickman, who quickly slips into the first real attack of the day. The pack have seen this all before. Roubaix is still 140 miles away, and there's no need yet for urgency, especially with the cobblestones to come. Bob Roll has reason to smile. The pace is easy, and his teammate Nickman is out in front. But the 13 spring lambs of Paris Roubaix waste no time. If the pack are ambling, they aren't. And with 11 teams represented in this front group, they combine as they speed towards the first of the 22 sections of cobbles. Are they on the road to stardom, or are they lambs to the slaughter? With all the favourites still here in the main field, there seems no cause for concern yet. Roy Nickman is only 22, but full of enthusiasm to pull this break along. The ex-New Yorker seizes his moment. The break is made up of young unknowns and others who've never won a classic race. It's enough to give them reason to race this hard, this early. And the lead quickly grows to two minutes in as many miles. It's obvious what the pack thinks. Let them go. If so, it's a sentiment not being shared here. As the race speeds towards Saint-Quentin in near-perfect conditions, there's a high speed of over 26 miles an hour. And there was already a feeling that this was no ordinary break in Paris-Roubaix.
the Australian Alan Piper, the pace setter here, is the best known in this front group, yet he's ranked only 94 in the world. Others in the lead may not even be known by the pack. Cornet von Ryan, Frank Buchonville, Eve von Steinwinkel. We'll forgive you if you ask who are they. I'm sure it's a question being asked in the group. But in fairness, Roy Nickman is known by them. He's young and has potential, and today is playing point man in the 7-Eleven strategy. Roy's in a break, right? Yeah. Yeah, they got like two or three minutes. Yeah. I'm gonna probably pass and go up there. If you're in the back before the cobbles, will you call me up so I can move up? Just like, uh, fake it? Okay. Team manager Mike Neal, an ex-rider himself, has Nickman in the lead group. And with over 100 miles to go, an early understanding of the race pattern is necessary. And no better rider to advise than Andy Hampston, who's riding in the main pack in his new role as chief scout. Neal needs to evaluate the attack and the likely reaction here. Hey, dude. So Roy's five minutes up. Five already, huh? Yeah. Guys, about a dozen? Yeah, I'm going to go up there and talk to him. And I'll be back. Okay, because I'm not sure who's in there, but I didn't see anyone big. But no. Kelly and Vander Arden are just hanging out. No, I just want to talk to him and make sure he's just sitting yeah, on yeah. and, you know, tell him to hang in there. Maybe yeah, he can do a good, good. job. I think it's kind of like, you know, we are talking about, because he'll make it. No, oh, that's anyone? great. Now it'll be perfect. It's amazing how much time they have already. He'll be way past the first feet before they can. Yeah. No, he'll be fine. Two miles ahead of the pack, but victory cannot be assured in this queen of the classics. Troisville is the gateway to the hell of the north. The worst roads in France. The 62 miles that have passed have nothing on the 104 that are to come. They have wondered about the conditions of this course on a dry day. The advanced vehicles rolling over the first cobbles have already found out. With the cyclist close behind, Mike Neal has caught up with his rider, Roy Nickman, who is still in the breakaway. Good fight, All right. Good job. Listen, let's work a little bit. I don't take any hard pulls. Try it. Come through normal. Save it. You're one of the best right. guys in this break. I'm doing what I can to sort of bolt it my way. Yeah. Pissing and eating at the back. Yeah. Just blow through when you have to, but you're one of the best guys in the break here. You're going to be great on the cobbles now. The breakaway has entered the first cobblestone. After some three hours and nearly 60 miles of civilized surfaces, the course now disintegrates into a path more suited for livestock. Alan Piper is the first casualty. The pace setter is paralyzed roadside with a flat. The loss of time is magnified by the amount of energy spent trying to regather any speed on the rough road. While American Roy Nickman rolls on, sustaining the bone-jarring punishment near the lead. As the pack arrives at the cobbles, the 170 remaining cyclists now must jockey for position. The roads become impossibly narrow, requiring the racers to ride in almost single file. Normally, these roads are made slick by spring rains and thick mud. However, the dryness has caused new concerns. Once a rider comes to the rough stones, dust flies. Visibility disintegrates and the urge to pull back becomes a very real nemesis. Especially since the breakaway speeds on. As dust settles, you begin to see the casualties strewn along the roadside. American Doug Shapiro illustrates the sacrificing role of the Dome Mystique by giving his wheel to a teammate who is designated to go on with the chase group. He's not the only one stuck without a wheel.
This is a thankless job to wait for help long after the race has passed you by. When the team car finally arrives and gives Shapiro a new wheel, his reward? To continue until he's needed again when the next teammate breaks down. By the time the riders have reached the town of Salem, 22 athletes have called it quits. More are about to do so. The feed station is the traditional spot for riders to abandon. Most never intended to go past this point. Among them, Andy Hampson, who said prior to the start that Salem would be his final destination. He'll be joined by other 7-Eleven teammates, including Doug Shapiro. Uh, I just helped Doug in the beginning. And then uh, somebody got a flat, gave my wheel, got dusty. It got really dusty. Uh, I, I couldn't, it was so dusty, you couldn't even see where you're going at all. So much fun. Uh, my lungs sound so good too, eh? Uh, 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 you stopped before it started. Here, we want you to under this car here. Your bag's right here. I was having trouble turning potatoes. <laughs> For these riders, two sections of the cobbles were more yeah. than enough. And while his team calls it a day behind, Roy Nickman leads the great escape. Perhaps the greatest seen in this race for over two decades. Behind the pack, searching for a leader, Meander lost through the villages of France. Thomas Regmuller came here to help pave the way for teammate Sean Kelly, but is now blazing his own trail. This group of opportunists are still building their lead at a time when the pack should be reeling them in. Without a leader either, the front group are surviving better than could ever have been imagined. Laurent Fignon is perplexed. All the men he fears are here, but with every turn of the pedals, others are gaining ground. Sean Kelly searches for help, hoping for the first signs of a reaction. Can, for example, a rider like Dirk de Mol, a Belgian who's never won a major race in his life, influence the outcome? With him, there are 12 like-minded men. This breakaway, started by riders the French call domestiques, men who help others to win, has developed into a serious attack that could never have been foreseen by the favourites. Now, the biggest obstacles for these men are not the riding legends behind, but the cobbled legend ahead. The forest of Orenburg awaits. So, after leading the Paris-Roubaix race for over three and a half hours, the 13 surprise leaders approach the main test, a forested corridor of misery that welcomes wheeled traffic only once a year. To lead over these terrible roads is an advantage, and Roy Nickman, young in years and mature in mind, leads the high-speed charge to the forest of Orenburg with 100 miles completed. The speed has been constantly high, and with the cobbles making steering difficult, the dangers are all too obvious. Less than a mile into the forest of pain, Nickman becomes a casualty. The banging and bouncing have caused him to blow out, and a cruel piece of luck, so typical of this race, is again shaping the outcome. Nickman is left on the roadside, waiting for a tyre, while the brake speeds away. Dancing to a tune that few in this group have ever heard before, Alan Piper continues to pull the leaders along. The Orenberg Trench has again begun to play its part in the race to Roubaix. Finally, Nickman gets a wheel, but he's already lost a minute, and with it, possibly his dreams of winning the race. Front, the end of the two-mile corridor is in sight, with the Dutchman, Corne von Rijn, setting the pace. While life behind the group is another world, the biggest danger to riders in Paris-Roubaix are their own team cars. Nickman is trapped, and it will be virtually impossible to catch up now.
discard but not beaten by any means the leaders are reduced to seven and they press on towards the Roubaix goal on smoother surfaces rarely has a group this big survived the forest crossing clearly this escape must be seen now as a danger still six minutes behind the main pack rushes at the forest at almost suicidal speed panicked by the lead of the breakaways for them the dangers are magnified tenfold one rider has fallen and like a house of cards the rest collapse this is why the crowd has come here reputations don't count for much on a road that has survived since roman times and the face of albert ackerman is sure to keep the reputation of paddy roubaix intact the rule on the road to roubaix is simple the pace setters always get caught the question is when and the look of panic is starting to show every turn in the road is a new lesson to learn and often that lesson is harsh The chasers are still in the forest. The worst place to be if you're trying to make up time. The huge crowds watch as the big names leave the forest. Meanwhile, the lesser-known leaders have found the size of this group advantageous to maintaining speed. In cycling, there's strength in numbers, and in Perry roubaix a breakaway this large after the forest is uncommon. They're being pulled along by each other, and the longer the leaders maintain the gap, the more they believe they can succeed. With every pave they tackle together, their confidence increases. The chase group led by Sean Kelly can't ignore the pace any longer. To wait for the anonymous breakaway to falter could be disastrous. Laurent Fignon is there as well, but after being content with marking Kelly all day, he too now realizes they've let the leader stray way too long. Kelly now finds himself in the unusual situation of chasing down one of his own teammates. The man who was supposed to set the pace for Kelly now sets the pace for the Mavericks in the lead. The mindset for the favorites has changed dramatically. They no longer wonder when they will catch the first group, but if they can catch the leaders at all. This rough and treacherous road to Roubaix has taken its toll on athletes for years, but cyclists aren't the only casualties. As we unfortunately found out, machinery isn't immune to the pounding either. But so many bikes and cars are easily towed away and put back together. The cyclists have found this road to Roubaix unforgiving. These breakdowns, both physical and mental, are not so easy to mend. The town of Roubaix is now well within reach. fields of northern France many battles have been won and lost but in sporting terms this year's Paris-Roubaix is proving one of the most interesting of them all unknowns had taken their chance early the only way they could hope to win now the favorites must recover from their shell-shocked state 
Sean Kelly, the winner twice in four years, has spent the day so far worried about his usual rivals. But now his thoughts have to be elsewhere. A small group has fled the bunch, led by Kelly. Laurent Fignon is also here. The preliminaries are over. Fignon is the man on form. Already this year, he's won the Italian Classic from Milan to San Remo. Everybody is saying he's back after two years slowed by injury, even though he's never finished this race. If he wins today, then Fignon's comeback will be complete. This select group of riders is well known to Sean Kelly, but no one, it seems, wants to make the move with him. And even Fignon, the rider who concerns Kelly the most, is not yet willing to take up the chase. How long can they wait? The breakaway has lost ground, but is the pack behind gaining fast enough before both cobbles and time runs out? still survive from the original 13 that escaped 26 miles outside Compiègne. The prospect of an unknown winning the greatest race of them all has to be faced as a reality. There's just 17 miles to go. Frustration and desperation is all that remains behind in the pack. Guido von Tempe, perhaps the fastest sprint finisher in the world, has escaped alone. Von Tempe faces now the longest sprint of his career if he's to win. A man who practically never rides alone has realized that unless desperate measures are taken, the elite of world cycling face the most embarrassing result ever seen in this race. With Bon Tempe going it alone, the long thin line indicates the reaction from the rest. There are still 80 riders rattling their way to Roubaix, but there are five ahead, too frightened to dream of the unthinkable. But the fear is about to become the fantasy of winning the cruelest of all classics. This lead now can be held if the riders don't make any major mistakes. The fields and cobblestones are giving way to the first signs of the city. The unexpected luck of being in the morning burst has carried the day. Guido Bontempi's lone attempt at catching the leaders failed a few miles after it began. There is now no one but spectators between the pack and a small band of men seeking to make history. Sean Kelly's undisputed world number one ranking begins to look tarnished as the all-day escape has succeeded. Kelly and the rest of the world's leaders are facing their heaviest defeat. The price, perhaps, of never believing that lesser men occasionally do what they have done naturally for many years. Kelly, sometimes referred to as the cannibal, still refuses to give up, setting a pace that no longer carries any hope of saving this day. He may not know it, but this escape is the longest on record for 30 years. In front from the 26th mile, Thomas Wegmuller from Switzerland tries for his greatest moment and attacks with 10 miles to go. He's chased by Dirk de Mol, the Belgian who's been conspicuous by his absence at the front of the group. He's now the only one with the energy to react after 130 miles in the lead. 13 riders tested the water almost five hours ago, and if tradition had been followed, they would have been swallowed up long before now. Instead, Redmuller ranked number 175, and De Mol, somewhat further back at 451, have the chance which they could never have thought possible. 
With the leaders approaching the finish, Laurent Pignon and the world's best have been made to look the fool. Outwitted by a group of riders for whom they have no respect whatsoever. The top riders are about to lose the richest single day race because they've spent all their time watching one another, believing one of them would win in the end. In this race without precedent, there is one more move to make, and Pignon finally breaks clear of the field, but with no hope of catching the two survivors up ahead. For them, the streets of Roubaix at last are beneath their wheels, and one thing is for sure, the results will not carry the name of Kelly or Pignon, but that of either Dirk de Mol or Thomas Wegmuller. After 164 miles of adversity, with dust and cobblestones, Perry Roubaix now delivers one of its coolest ironies. Thomas Wigmuller got a plastic bag sucked into his derailleur, locking his gears. And without the ability to shift, he is virtually helpless in a sprint with the mole. Fignon has entered town as well, but he knows his fate, and his final effort is much too late. As Big Mueller struggles with the bag, he gets assistance from his team car. Ironically, Dirk de Mol does not seize the opportunity to leave him behind. Instead, he continues to draft. Meanwhile, Sean Kelly wears the blood from a fall he experienced in the last section of cobblestones. His chance for a third victory must now wait at least another year. As the leaders reach the final straightaway, Dirk de Mol positions himself for the pass. With the finish in sight, de Mol reaches for his gear, downshifting for the sprint. Big Mueller's gears are still locked, with a plastic bag still jammed in his derailleur. Helplessly, he looks on as Dirk de Mol, a 29-year-old virtual unknown, pulls off one of the biggest upsets ever at Perry Roubaix. has raced for six different teams in an effort to win his chance. Only a week before, this former factory worker had been dropped by his team for a major classic. Just three days ago, he finished fourth in a race, but was not listed in the final results because his team failed to register his number. Now in Roubaix, there's respect. For Thomas Wigmuller, frustration. The pace setter worked the hardest all day, only to fall victim to the cruelest of fates. The final standing show us that Vignon came in third, the best American finisher, Bob Roll. Roy Nickman finished 14 minutes, 12 seconds off the pace. But the story is Dirk de Mol, who wins the world's greatest one-day race, the 44th Belgian champion since 1896. For Phil Liggett, I'm Tim Brandt saying so long from Roubaix, France.